and welcome to this edition of Trader Talk TV. Today we've got Ari Paparo, a legend in the industry, here today. Thanks for having me. Ari's the uh, CEO of Beeswax, and before we jump into this subject, let's talk a bit, bit, bit about uh, Beeswax and what it, is it, what do you do? Sure, Beeswax is a startup that I founded with two other Google co-founders, and the idea is to have what we call the bidder as a service, a fully customizable single tenant DSP. So. In our cloud, Coke and Pepsi are different. They don't separate data, separate algorithms, separate data feeds, and that gives you an enormous amount of customization and capabilities. And that fits nicely to today's subject because today's subject is about in housing, and we're going to talk about what is it and the structures of it. And Harry's coming today to talk about it, and you're going to sort of map out what it looks like within an organization. That's right. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the setup. And I have the pen so I can really <laughs> draw all, whatever I want. You're the master. So first, make sure to follow me at Ari Pap on Twitter. There you go. There, the unsolicited uh, promotion. Uh, in terms of in-housing, the way I think about it is uh, you have to think about three different parameters, two, three different ways uh, uh, it, you may need to invest if you want. Uh, first of all, it's not for everyone. No. Uh, there are plenty of brands that uh, that are very well suited to have an agency controlling most of the programmatic mm. spend. Um, uh, but for those who want to take a little more control, uh, there's really three things to think about. Okay. Um, first thing I would say is, and I'll put these little boxes here so it looks like I have thought about this. Yeah. Uh, what's the strategy? Second thing is, what is the people? Who are the people who will be doing the work? And the third thing, uh, is what is the technology that you're going to bring to bear. Uh, and I think usually the technology is where most people do all the talking. There's okay. a lot of conversation. Should you have your DL and DSP or not? But technology is only one part of it. You really need to figure out what the holistic uh, concept is. Okay. So how, let's talk about, this is often a big topic or subject. You've got a and talking about how in-housing is happening. Mm -hmm. But the reality is building an in-house strategy is very complicated. Yes. And the tech part is the sexy part because it's kind of newsworthy part, right, right. you know? So let's talk about the, the, the nuts and bolts, the things that people yeah. don't want. Strategy, let's talk about that first. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about why why would a company or a brand take it in-house? What's the motivations behind it? Let's talk a bit about that. Let's, let's yeah. talk about some of your clients that you work with in the US particularly. Right. Yeah, I mean, uh, to start with, with any strategy conversation, it's what are the business outcomes I'm looking to achieve? Um, why am I not satisfied with the current with the current situation? Usually it has to do with some measure of transparency. Uh, I'll even write it down here. Transparency, uh, second thing is control, and the third thing is costs. Those are usually the three driving factors that may uh, start this in-housing conversation. Mm. Um, now, transparency, I'm not the first one to bring that up. Everyone brings no. that up, right? Yes. Uh, and you have the CMO of, uh, of P&G, Mark Pritchard, yeah. talking about that. Uh, Take rates, SPO, all that kind exactly. of Exactly. And, you know, there's some really great uh, achievements to be had just by talking about it, just mm. by being uh, working in kind of the overall ad tech political sphere. It's like, yeah. I want transparency. That's good for everybody, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. Um, but there's also the next level of that, where um, where for certain customers, let's say in regulated industries mm. uh, or in uh, highly um, highly direct response industries, yeah. where they want to see every little detail of the data and they can handle that. They have data lakes, they have professionals, they ha they are willing to take the effort on transparency, and they can't get it when there's an intermediary in between them and the data. So like outcome based entity so like King would be a good example of the, you know, the selling their games Candy Crush etc absolutely and and then obviously the transparency on the data side banking clients who are very very mm -hmm. have to be very strict about how who used their data and what it's used it, for exactly and where um, there are some customers for whom anti-fraud is not enough you can't just say oh well we use great vendor to do anti-fraud they want to look they want to know for themselves how well the anti-fraud mm. is working mm. they want to know for example that they're never ever showing an ad outside of a geography they're allowed to serve okay um, and that really goes kind of blends closely into control. Mm -hmm. um, the um, control works around those defensive parts, like I was saying, you know, staying, of, uh, staying abreast of regulatory issues, but also offensive. Um, I want to get the lowest CPI I can, and right now the only way I can get a CPI in the mobile example is through an ad network where I have no control. Mm -hmm. so, uh, and so I want to talk, I want to take this in-house, and I want to be able to really drive my CPIs or my CPAs or whatever lower every single day create a learning organization, uh, and get better and better at this as a competitive advantage. Okay. And then the costs, obviously. Costs, obviously. The fewer middlemen, just by its very nature, should reduce costs. Um, if 
if um, if as a company I am working through, let's say, an agency who has their own DSP deal, it's possible the agency has better rates, but it's also possible they don't. And this is where procurement comes in as well? I mean, are they, are they heavily involved in that conversation? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So um, with procurement working through an agency, there's often a disconnect where uh, the agency feels as though it's not being treated fairly. The procurement department just wants the lowest rates possible. Mm -hmm. uh, in an in-house scenario, that conversation changes very radically. Mm. Um, really, the procurement is only talking about the tech cost, the hard costs, yeah. and then it's up to that in-house team to drive drive everything lower. Okay, so let's move on from that strategy. These, are, these yeah. are key points before you kind of make this kind of decision. Absolutely. The next sort of uh, thing you need to think about is people and talent, yes. right? Which is obviously a big thing. Um, you've got, you know, celebrity uh, sort of in-housing brands or like mm -hmm. Netflix, for instance. Yep. But the people, it's a technology company, mm -hmm. right? So people want to work for Netflix because yes. it's, it's got that tech uh, halo, right? But let's talk about other brands that have don't have that tech yeah. and our traditional brands. This is obviously a key piece because Absolutely. there's not many of us that can do this type of thing and optimization is hard. Yes, I mean, in, a, in many brands, the folks who are in the marketing organization in charge of programmatic um, are understaffed and uh, really don't have access to a lot of what we think of as technology resources. So there's really three things. There's, there's ad ops, there's data science, and there's engineering. And many brands don't have any of these. Um, some brands have all three. Like, for example, at Beeswax, we work with Legendary Pictures, and we have a case study on our website about that. They're a rare brand that's all of that. They're, they're, they're really just trying to put uh, people into movie theater seats when a movie comes out, but they have a team that looks at the data, creates algorithms in Java and C++. They're, they're, the, they're the poster child for in-housing. Right. Um, so, but their 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 business is very outcomes based as well. That's absolutely. Like bums and seat type thing. Bums and seats. Now, for most companies that are looking at some form of in source uh, in or in housing, um, there may be a line kind of around here where they're willing to put in the effort to bring in some folks who are ad ops or ad ops light. Yeah. Uh, but they may the these are a bit of a stretch. It's a bit of a stretch to start having well, staffing on data science and engineering. First of all, these people are very rare they are. in the market. And they, are. they have to be convinced to go to work for these companies. It's true. In the marketing department. Yes. Right? You also have an interesting geography problem. If I if I may sure. draw this is roughly Great Britain. Here's London. Yeah. Right. Brands over here. Too far. It's yeah. distance. Yeah. In the United States, I could draw the exact same diagram, and I would say, here's where the ad ops people are, New York, San Francisco, <laughs> and here's where the brands are, right like in the in middle. In the Midwest, yeah. <laughs> Might be few, you know. There's a couple. Yeah. yeah that was yeah. a terrible United States. Hold yeah, on. Let me make Florida, Florida like, look a little yeah. better. Yeah, Florida's good. And be. put in Long Island. Yeah. yeah. There you All right, go. there you go. Uh, so, <laughs> the Trump one as well, but hey, we'll leave that alone. <laughs> we'll leave that alone. Yeah. Um, um, so, so, you, so you think you, it, concentration of tech companies attracts certain talent, and that's where you know you need to, that's where you need to be so the brands as you say traditional brands like mattress brands mm -hmm. or see uh, fmcg brands are sort of like in these these weird geography is one yeah. aspect also they don't have a pipeline necessarily right. the, or the young employees they're bringing into the marketing department aren't on a track to suddenly become right. uh, run programmatic campaign and also it's a case of if you if you're in this industry it's almost like being a coder, you want to learn from people mm -hmm. above you, and the way you learn is to work with the best. Who are usually an agent. Yeah, so like, you know, CTOs are also, uh, a CTO's worth his weight and going because they take developers with them, and people want to learn from that person. That's exactly right. And and, and I suppose the agencies, as you say, are, are, and the ad tech are the breeding ground for a lot of these people. Like yes. so. So this is where I think there are interesting hybrid strategies. Uh, I, I think you were speaking to me earlier about the levels of insourcing, sure. right? And so uh, the most common way people are in-house or insourcing is where the the uh, marketer is taking control of the tech, right? But the agency is still uh, taking care of the people, right? And they're being paid appropriately for the use of those people. And I think that's actually a potentially very beneficial relationship, right? Combination. Um, and and would you say that 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 that, that hasn't been reported on? as much that when we hear about in house and people think, Oh, bring it on in the house but actually it's more these hybrid relationships that are that are starting to pop up. I think that's right. I th I think that it's a very beneficial conversation, and it happens very frequently where the market the marketer is saying, uh, "I have my DMP relationship. I I want to own my DSP relationship," 
and it's and hello, Mr. Agency, your agency of record for digital. This do, shouldn't affect you negatively. This should enhance our conversation and our relationship. Mm. Um, and but you know, th in this industry, everyone likes to complain. Everyone likes to fight. And uh, th and there are always examples of people where they don't get along. And I yeah. think that gets a little more highlighted. Do you think there's an opportunity here to, for new entities to arrive and do execution? I mean, I know yeah. agencies do that, but they've been some of them have been slow to kind of move in this direction and they still are. You know, I, still I think are. if you look at uh, like if you look at the list of some of the top programmatic agencies, they're all kind of in this pattern, like yeah. people like Media IQ, uh, where they invest very heavily in making DSPs more successful uh, on behalf of agencies with some proprietary tech, not necessarily hard coding one DSP into there. Um, Fine line between uh, network and agencies there, maybe IQ. Uh, you know, I, I just threw that example out. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think agencies that are leaning into programmatic or right. most, or most uh, well suited to bring a marketer along with the marketer choosing the tech. Right. So that you're like, this is likely to be the, to, to be the model going forward in many ways for a lot of um, um, brand, brands in Europe specifically. I, I think so. I, I think in Europe specifically, uh, talent is even harder to address than in the United mm -hmm. States. Um, and uh, I think you'll see some direct response oriented advertisers go full programmatic take it all in house like a booking.com like a booking.com yeah, perfect booking. travel yeah. uh, gambling those kind of uh, those kind yeah. of entities um, but for mainstream marketers uh, in the European market I think you'll still see heavy agency involvement but more control over strategy and more control over tech so let's talk about the tech piece then. absolutely that's yeah. that's the last piece of the puzzle yeah. I mean how important is that I mean obviously these these pieces have to be there for us before right. you can do that so how, 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 how big is that issue there as well? Well, uh, with tech, I think absolutely, um, this is where I'd be an advocate. I've been very neutral so far. Yeah. I'd be an advocate, but I think that any marketer who's spending significantly on programmatic should have a very strong point of view on who the DSPs is or are that mm -hmm. they work with and look at at least contracting in-house that DSP, even if it is more of an agency-led relationship. So, so I think with tech, your questions are, you have the contract, um, you, you, you have a tie to strategy, so what are you trying to accomplish? What kind of relationship do you want as a choice of DSP? Um, you have, and this also relates to strategy, what sort of data and strategy can be expressed in that DSP? Um, and, and lastly is um, how much you want to you know, custom or, or bespoke based on what you're trying to accomplish. Yeah. Every, every marketer is different, and even within a single marketer, you may have 100 different strategies and budgets, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and you have to align your choice of tech against that. So, I mean, to not to pick on Google, but it, you, if you want to buy YouTube through a DSP, you only have one choice, right? And it's hard to argue against that. If YouTube's important to your business, yeah. you should probably have a, uh, a uh, DBM account, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, that's just the way it is. Yeah. Uh, um, and in terms of like the custom spoke stuff, how how important is that now going forward? Because obviously your business is based around that kind of ethos that absolutely. you're building to fit the needs and requirements of your customers. So like we 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 had like the, the sort of enterprise DSPs like the the the, the DBMs and the trade mm -hmm. desks and and the media mats of the world and data zoos of the world who were the first wave. But now we're talking about well, clients are going well. We want this. We want that because right. as you said, no brand is the same has the same KPIs yeah. or the same outcomes. I th we think it's incredibly important. Obviously, that's why we're in the business. Uh, we, we think that the idea that a single uh, algorithm, single data science model across hundreds of customers can work is is not um, being proven out in the reality. Um, there's a big difference between a return on ad sales, uh, ad spends, uh, ROAS yeah. type uh, metric versus you know a click through sign up type metric right. or, or like an automotive six month delayed conversion Type yeah. activity, yeah. and um, and to some extent you can get this done with different DSPs. A DSP may offer you know APIs for doing that. Um, but what is important, I think, when you think about this giant investment we're making, is how do you how do you make this a regular part of your business and you know work the muscle so that um, your marketing team, either with or without your agency, and usually in conjunction with your DSP, is getting better every single day at what they do best. Yeah. Be it drive people to. Uh, to showrooms of cars or get people to buy more in the, at the supermarket, whatever it is, let's get better at it every single day. And the way you do that, one of the ways to do that is by leveraging tech. Can we talk just briefly about your 
basis. I'd love to hear more yeah. about the legendary stuff. So how does legendary work mm -hmm. with your your uh, your technology? How does it plug in? What's yeah. what, what's so different? Yeah, so legendary really did two things that were unique. Uh, they brought a custom algorithm uh, that they built from scratch. So um, talking about getting better every day, they they realized that the metrics and the capabilities of DSPs to drive people into movie theaters was somewhat uh, disjointed because there wasn't a conversion signal that was very reliable. Right, right. People don't buy movie uh, uh, movie tickets on the same page they advertise on for right. the most part. It's a different page. Um, so they, they realized that there were other signals they could use, like uh, very precise geography, um, th some third-party data in some cases, um, patterns of behavior on the web, and they built an, their own algorithm. Um, our DSP is really the only one where a customer can write their own algorithm. Um, so that's a unique selling proposition of ours and also worked really well for them. Uh, the second thing they did was unique data. So they did have some secondary data about people and whether they visited the movie theaters, whether they actually saw certain movies, Movies. Uh, I think this was related to the Kong movie that was out last year. Yeah. Uh, and they were able to use that data in the algorithm, you know, in a very rapid sense. Interesting. Yeah. So in, in terms of Europe, where do you where do you see this model going? And yeah. And, and where, what, what's next steps for, for Brian thinking about this stuff? Yeah, I, I think that Europe is an interesting market because um, the cliche is that Europe is six months behind the United States. I don't think that's accurate at all. It's just different. Uh, it's so different. Yeah. So many different geographies and so many different ways of buying. Yeah, exactly. So in the German market where I think the publishers are, are uh, setting powerful. the tone, yeah. um, the, the market um, probably is less likely to appeal to you know, direct in-housing. Yeah. But the publishers, in many cases, are partnering with brands and right. building interesting solutions. Interesting. Um, UK market is very agency-centric. I yeah. think we'll see a lot of these hybrid models. Uh, unlikely that um, that uh, we'll see a you know quick turnover to switching switching direction in the UK market. But I, th I think we'll see more hybrids yeah. with agencies. And France, just like we we're doing ATS Paris in a couple of weeks, and mm -hmm. it's quite interesting as well. A lot of the the, the big e-commerce brands mm -hmm. are now partnering with. Uh, technology to sort of use their sales data yeah. towards KPIs and kind of almost having the, sort of the, the Amazon effect, if you will, they see opportunity to build ad models. Quite, and I, it's quite an interesting, interesting model. Again, Absolutely. very different from the UK because you, you're right. The agencies control here. They they they, they sort of uh, run run the whip over over everybody here. But in France, it's quite different than the, and, 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 and Germany. I think e-commerce in general is a very interesting space because uh, when you go to uh, when you talk to an e-commerce marketing manager about the programmatic stack, it looks very different from a nor from a mainstream marketer right. because Critio's on top. Um, they they may say, oh well, we use DBM Critio and then a couple of other vendors. If you talk to a marketer like a CPG, Critio is not even on the list, um, and uh, and that is an interesting opportunity in some cases because obviously it's a very, pretty fat budget line item without has no transparency, no control, and high cost. Black box effect. Black box, yeah. right? An ad uh, network in many ways. Of course. Yeah. Um, not that I'm not I'm harping on them, but um, if you think about e-commerce, what do they have? They do have people. They do have data science. They do have engineering. They have these problems. And they're putting a lot of their money into a black box. Yeah. So that's an opportunity for everybody. Interesting. Well, Larry, thanks for that overview on, on, uh, in housing because uh, I think people need to know what's going on. And we'll definitely have you in later in the year. And we'll probably see you at ATS London this year as well. So Right. Thanks, thanks for having for me. Coming. I apologize for the bad England. It's drawing. fantastic. A fantastic. Sorry, wait, wait, I'm sorry. I forgot earlier. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's, <laughs> the, that's the occupying six counties, but we're not good at that now. <laughs> and uh, that was Trader Talk TV. And we'll see you next week. <laughs>